Stephen, thank you for having me on today. I was just saying in the warm up before we started the interview that I think I've known you now for 16 or 17 years. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I look forward to answering, answering your questions. Thank you. You've been re-elected since every election since 2005. What got you into politics and what backgrounds of people do you most represent? So um, I've always believed that politics is a force for good. I know at all times politicians come under criticism and we're all told we're a bunch of rogues and mischief makers, but that's been the case throughout history. But we still live in a great and wonderful country and that's been shaped by politics and it's such a privilege and honour to be part of that process. And I know how lucky I am to be the MP for Broxbourne and I'm always grateful when I am returned to office. What are your own experiences of mental health and some of those challenges you face? Well, I think the, the, the big challenge here is to remember that everybody, wherever they come from, whoever they are, has mental health. And we talk about mental health, but perhaps we should now talk about mental well-being. We should keep people as much as we can strong and, and resilient and able to cope with the, the daily challenges of life, while also recognising there are people um, with, with mental health challenges um, that are going to be with them throughout their life. And we need to make those challenges manageable as far as we can, and we need to support those people in meeting those challenges and that's hopefully what we're doing. There's always more to be done. I know when I got here 17 years ago, mental health was talked about in hushed tones. People didn't really want to uh, talk about their own mental health and they didn't want to talk about other people's mental health, but we've now got over that and that's, that's a really good thing, but there is so much more to be done. In 2012, yourself and Kevin Jones, Labour MP, uh, both gave historic speeches uh, describing your own mental health. In 1996, uh, I suffered uh, from quite a uh, deep depression. Uh, it was a result related to work issues and other things that were going on in my life at the moment. And that's the first time I've ever spoken to it. Some of my family, what I'm saying today, don't actually know about what I'm going to say. Um, because, like a lot of men, what you do is try and deal with it yourself. You don't talk to people. And I just hope you realise my speaker, what I'm saying is very difficult for me now. I thought very long and hard. I didn't actually make the decision until I actually just put my notes down to do it. It is hard because you actually don't recognise, first of all, it creeps up on you very slowly. We're also, I think, in politics, um, designed to think that somehow that if you admit fault or fealty, you're going to be, uh, you know, looked upon in a disparaging way in terms of both the electorate but also your peers as well. Now, whether this now that Macon's admission means that any future ministerial career is actually blighted forever, but I was a minister in the last government and I think most people thought I did a reasonable job on both sides of the, the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think we've got to talk about mental health uh, in this place and people who've got uh, an experience of it personally in this house. I am delighted to say that I have been a practising fruitcake for, <laughs> for, for 31 years because it was 13 years ago at St John's Wood tube station and I remember it vividly that I was visited by obsessive compulsive disorder and over the past 31 years it has played a fairly significant part in my life. On occasions it is manageable and on occasions it becomes quite difficult. It takes you to some quite dark places. But I operate to the rule of four, so I have to do everything at even. So I have to wash my hands four times. I have to go in and out of a room four times. My wife and children often say I resemble an extra from Riverdance as I bounce in and out of a room, switching lights off four times. And woe betide me if I switch off a light five times, then I've got to do it another three times. So <laughs> counting becomes very, very important. I have been pretty, pretty healthy for, for five years, but just when you let your guard down, this aggressive friend comes and smacks you 
right in the face. For example, I was on holiday recently and I took a beautiful photograph of my son carrying a fishing rod. I love fishing. Honourable members may know that. There was my beautiful son carrying a fishing rod. I was glowing with pride. Then the voice starts, if you don't get rid of that photograph, your child will die. And you fight those voices for a couple of three hours. You know that you really shouldn't give in to them because they shouldn't be there and it ain't going to happen, but in the end, you ain't going to risk your child, so you give in to the voices, and then you feel pretty miserable about it. Kevin and I are, uh, are still in Parliament, and we're, we're still good friends. Personally, it was a great relief to get it off my chest. Um, uh, it was for others to decide uh, whether the, speech, the speeches we made were historic or important or helpful. I certainly think they were helpful. I certainly think they were helpful. I think they allowed more people to talk about their, their own experiences. And mental health is something that we all have. Mental well-being is something that we all have, and we shouldn't be afraid to discuss it. Now, the thing I think is really important out of all of this is when you ask someone, how are you feeling today? You're actually interested in the answer. Does that make sense? It's not just an aside. How are you doing? And then you move on. And I've got friends, as I'm sure you do, Stephen, who you know are in a bad place, having a difficult time in their life. And when you say to them, how are you feeling today? And they go the normal response, I'm fine. Then I think it's important to say, are you really fine? Are you sure you're fine? Because that is a genuine question I've asked you. And then that might elicit a conversation where I actually say, well, no, I'm struggling a bit at the moment. We raise awareness of mental health and aim to reduce stigma. How important is it to raise awareness and what more needs to be done? I think stigma has certainly reduced. I think uh, people are much more understanding of, of mental health conditions, particularly life-changing mental health conditions. For example, psychosis and schizophrenia. Uh, I've always said we will know we've come a long way when we actually reduce the disparity of life expectancy between those with psychosis, a diagnosis of psychosis, schizophrenia, and those without that diagnosis. Because currently, if you have that diagnosis, your life expectancy is reduced by, on average, 15 plus years. Now that is, that is totally unacceptable and something that needs to be addressed. And that's one of the actions. It's all right talking about mental health, but actually we've got to make some real inroads and make sure people's life expectancy, regardless of their condition, um, is in line with the national life expectancy of all people. You were honoured with a KBE and knighted as a sir. How proud a moment was it to receive such distinguished honours? It would be churlish of me not to say that it was, I was very proud. I was, it's no secret that I was extremely close and fond of the previous Prime Minister, Theresa May. I supported her through, throughout her premiership. She has worked with me while she was at the Home Office on a number of issues around mental health and the mental health of minority communities in the UK in particular. And uh, obviously her premiership ended, I think, in a, in a very sad way, but all premierships tend to end in a sad way. So I was extremely touched, extremely touched that she put me on her resignation honours list. It was. Um, I, I don't know whether it was deserved or not, but the fact is that she, she did it. And going to the palace, meeting Prince Charles, having my family with me was just a very, very special day. And it was made even more special because the um, former chief executive of Black Mental Health UK was there. And she is someone I introduced um, to Theresa May. Well, Theresa May was the Home Secretary and they work together on improving um, the mental health outcomes in minority communities. And it was fantastic to be, to see Matilda McCatrum turn up on the same day that I was there with her family to receive her honour. We actively support mental health organisations like ourselves and Viewpoint. Uh, what are some of the biggest challenges at the moment and some of the biggest concerns you have regarding mental health? I mean, I think, the, the, the issue always remains funding, doesn't it? That my experience of the mental health charities in Hertfordshire and in and around my constituency is they make a little money go a very, very, very long way. And, and actually they're extremely good 
at taking their resources and stretching it and helping the maximum number of people. I recognise that and I think there are other people across the county that do in, in government jobs and NHS jobs. And it's again, it's something we talked about before this interview started. I think it's really important that charities have a diversity of funding streams. You don't want to be reliant on, say, one or two major contributors, albeit that's very helpful. You want to have a number of contributors making up a smaller proportion of your revenue stream. So if somebody drops out, it doesn't mean that the programmes you're delivering are impacted immediately and you've got plenty of time to try and find someone else to fill that gap. Yeah, sure. How important is parity for mental health with physical health? It's absolutely critical because as, as people say you can't have one, one without the other. So we want healthy people in this country. Now you'll be aware Stephen because we communicated during lockdown that there were a lot of people who were put under a huge amount of pressure and some people found that pressure at times almost too much to bear and that had a really, really bad effect on their on their well being. And we need to support we need to support those people um, back 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 to good health. And something I'm hopefully going to be doing in the next couple of weeks, certainly supporting, is a is a, a listening day for youngsters. So we actually listen to youngsters about their experience of lockdown because while well, all age groups suffered, I think many of them suffered the most. I became aware of young women with eating disorders. Some people who had managed an addiction fell back on that addiction. So we, we've really got to understand that the lockdown was done for our physical health, but there will be mental health consequences coming out of that lockdown that, we, that will be with us for some time. And we need to help people recognize those, those problems and then we need to help them deal with them. How important is healthy living and having hobbies and activities when facing mental health challenges? It's extremely important uh, because if you're with other people, and I think it's really important to be with other people as often as possible, sharing experiences, laughing together, talking together, eating together, then you're less likely to, to turn in on yourself, if, if that makes sense. Because there's a lot of really good people out there and an experience shared is much better than an experience kept within you. And I would hope that the one thing we've learned, one of the things we've learned from lockdown is actually we are very social, social creatures and actually separating us from our support networks for an extended period of time does have a deleterious effect on people's well-being. Since your time in Parliament, what have been the biggest improvements with mental health and what are some of the biggest challenges we face? I think there's been a number of really big improvements. Um, there was the Mental Health Discrimination Bill, now an act which actually ended discrimination, <laughs> didn't put more discrimination in about being a company director, jury service, which basically said if you've had a mental health problem in the past, it doesn't mean you cannot serve on a jury, it doesn't mean you cannot be a company director or a school governor. And I think that was a really totemic um, change, although it was only a small piece of legislation, it was introduced by a Conservative backbencher, now Lord Barwell, who was then a backbencher, went on to be Theresa May's Chief of Staff. Theresa May had mental well-being at the forefront of her premiership. Uh, Boris Johnson has seized that, certainly Keir Starmer on the Labour benches has put a really strong team in place behind him around whole, the whole issue of mental well-being. So of course we're all political Stephen and I know that lots of people will say ah yes but Charles Walker your government hasn't done this that and the other and that's absolutely fine we want debate but I think the direction of travel is, is really positive and we're beginning to remove the discriminations from the health system around mental health. In 2019, there were 5,691 deaths registered in England and Wales. Uh, three quarters of those were from men. It's very sad and very tragic for those loved ones and for those individuals. And how do we best highlight such a sensitive subject and get people from all backgrounds to talk about things when they're in difficulty? So death by suicide is tragic. It's tragic for the person who dies, but it leaves a huge legacy of grief 
behind with families wondering what more they could have done and what greater interventions they could have made. You know, the government has a, a zero suicide strategy, which is let's aim for zero. Probably impossible to get there, but let's aim for zero. But it is absolutely the case, as you identified in your question, that men are really bad at reaching out for help because it's still seen as an unmasculine thing to do. So we need to encourage people to reach out to help for help if they feel they need help, which is why when you ask the question, how are you feeling today? You've got to be interested in the answer because often the first intervention can be made by a friend, yeah? Who says, you know what? You shouldn't be feeling like that. You might need some help. Would you like to talk about your emotions at the moment? If not with me, with, with someone else. But the fact of the matter is, as your question rightly identifies, men are most at risk from, from suicide. All suicides are a tragedy that we have got to address the fact that men are really, really bad at asking for help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Charles Walker. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.